impeachment improves Trump's re-election chances. Okay. You have boxes for me to take. Oh, inventor of Labradoodle Welcome regrets his creation. With Dr. Judy Moore. I, I can be, I came out in the Pets Plus Bulletin. I can be real popular with that one. at her website at www.drjudymorgan.com. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Morning, folks. I know it's Friday and I'm dressed in my work clothes. I'm trying to get the page up. Um, but because I took Tuesday off to be at the hospital with Hugh, I offered... You. <laughs> you're welcome. I offered to work... Um, today for Dr. Candle to give her a day off this week uh, and it ended up working out great because she and her husband uh, he had the day off from work and I think she's going to an agility trial she does agility with her dogs and uh, she was going to an agility trial in Maryland so they were really excited they could actually pack up early and get on the road and not be doing it at 10 o'clock <laughs> at night so ended up working out really well for both of us um, hello Singapore well wow, we're worldwide this morning for sure um, so I wanted to, I had a new client in yesterday, old client actually, um, who has a new dog who came in yesterday and uh, she's a great, great client, love her. And she had a Cocker Spaniel who was one of my favorite patients and that little Cocker was diagnosed many, many years ago with mast cell cancer and she had tumors over her rear end and tumors over her shoulders. So most likely from vaccinations that she had been given earlier in life and she had undergone chemotherapy at the University of Pennsylvania and they did multiple rounds, multiple protocols, and they could not get the cancer to go away. And so they said, well, we can, and she also had multiple surgeries and they said, well, we can do radiation or there's nothing else we have to offer. And she didn't want to do radiation, smart woman, and came to me and we did not ever make the tumors. What? Oh, Ireland too. Cool. We did not ever make the tumors go away. But they stayed quiet and they didn't progress and the dog lived happily ever after with the tumors and she died at the ripe old age of 17 totally unrelated to her mast cell cancer so uh, this is why i'm always willing to fight for these guys uh, let's see the dog survived a house fire with the woman i mean just all kinds of of things it just uh, the little dog was a survivor she's a great girl her name was lally um but so it's been a few months since lally passed and her mom said hugh's doing great uh her mom said or the mom said i'm gonna get another dog and so she decided she was gonna rescue this time and she went out and rescued a little puppy mill mama a little maltese girl about six seven pounds cute little dog cute cute about six years old, rotten teeth. So she has been churning out litter after litter after litter for the past six years. And um, just a sweet little dog. But, you know, typical puppy mill dog. She, uh, and this is the first time this owner has had a puppy mill rescue. And so she brought her list of questions. And they included things like, she won't urinate on the grass. She doesn't even want to walk in the grass. And so I had to explain that, these dogs that come from puppy mills don't know what grass is. They've never seen it. They've been sitting in a wire cage, maybe suspended from the ceiling, maybe stacked many high for six years. And so she doesn't know what grass is. And the owner said, well, she also doesn't, you know, she's very, very hard to housebreak, but she seems to be okay using piddle pads. 
And I said, well, then let's just train her to piddle pads because she doesn't know what the outside is. She thinks she's supposed to go inside. That was what we discovered with Pookie. And Pookie was only in the mill for a year and a half and never even had puppies. But she had no clue that she was supposed to urinate outside. And most of our dogs won't go urinate in the grass. They go on our brick or concrete patios because that's more similar to what they were doing inside. So Pookie would literally go outside, stand there with her legs crossed, and wait to run back in the house to use a pee pad. Because to her, that was the safe spot. Nobody was going to eat her while she was trying to pee. And, uh, you know, the great thing about having them trained to a pedal pad is you can take pee pads with you. You go on an airplane flight, you go, you know, traveling, you're in a hotel room, and you can't get your dog outside right away. If they're trained to a pad, you throw it on a pad, and they run over and use it, and life is good. And you never have to worry about them ruining carpet somewhere. So for us, that worked out really well. So she said, oh, well, I have some piddle pads, and I'm just going to get some more of the washable piddle pads. And, and you're right, I want to travel with this dog a lot. I want to fly with her. And luckily, she's small, so she can go in the cabin. And, um, she said, I'm just going to train her to the pee pads. I'm not even going to try for outside. I said, that's, that's awesome. That'll, that'll work out great. And then she said, well, the first night I put her in a crate in the kitchen and she just cried all night long. And she said, I felt so sorry for her that the next night I brought the crate and I put it beside my bed. And she said she slept all night. She was so happy. So here's the thing with a puppy mill dog who is used to being in a crate. A lot of people say, oh, I'm never going to put that dog in a crate again. Your days in a crate are over. Well, you have to remember that for puppy mill dogs, that's their safe zone. The crate is their safe hiding place. So Laura Lou was my first English toy rescue. And if we would leave her alone in the house with the other dogs, but if we weren't home, if I left her out of a crate, she literally would spin. She would run from room to room to room, just in a panic, peeing, pooping, shaking, just an absolute mess. If I put her in a crate with a blanket before we left, she would curl up and go to sleep, happy as a clam, sleep the entire time. And when we get home, she'd run out and greet us. And she was really happy. Now, if I had had the mindset of you're never going to be in a crate again, that poor dog would have died of separation anxiety and never would have had a good life. The crate was her safe space. Now that's not necessarily true for every single dog, but in this little dog's case and in my little dog's case, that was their safe zone. However, they also like to have company. So we would leave a crate open next to Laura and the other dogs, we had a lot of puppy mill rescues, they would actually go in the crate and sleep right next to her, but they were in the one with the open door so they could come and go if they wanted to. Most of the time they didn't even bother, they just, they all slept there. This little dog, she wanted company, the owner only has one dog, but by being in the bedroom with the crate next to her bed, solved the problem. Because remember that dog came from a puppy mill where there were hundreds of other dogs and a lot of times puppies in the cage with her. So she was used to having other dogs with her and having company. So we solved that problem. The next thing she said is, well, she has no idea how to walk on a leash. I can't get her to walk on the leash. Again, foreign object to her. Dog has no idea what, what that is. The other thing with this little dog, she, um, came from rescue with this really heavy collar and leash. It was for like a 50 pound dog. And the woman said, yeah, I've got to get her something different. This thing is just so heavy. And uh, the other thing is this dog had had a chain embedded in her neck. And so she's, you know, got some sensitivity there. And I said, well, you could put a, a loose collar on for ID, a small one uh, that wouldn't be heavy for her, but let's put her in a harness for walking because I think it would be more comfortable for her. And I said, what you want to do right now is just get her used to the harness. And then next you want to get her used to a very, very light lead. Let her just, you know, walk around the yard with the lead on, but nobody attached to it. And you just call her and let her come to you. And, you know, the, it's interesting. The dog is not real food motivated. She doesn't understand treats. So we're working on that as well. We have to have really, really high value treats for her. She also has a lot of really rotten teeth. So we've got to fix those so her teeth aren't sore. Um, but... I also recommended, because this is a small dog, that she get a shoulder bag. Put the dog in the shoulder bag, let her little head hang out, take her for walks that way. Pookie walked in a shoulder bag with us for the first year. And we would have all the other dogs on leashes, and Pookie was just happy as could be to hang out in her little shoulder bag and watch the world go by and watch the other dogs. And, you know, with time, we kept putting her on the ground, putting the leash on with the other dogs. And, you know, she'd walk a couple steps, and then she'd walk a couple more. 
And eventually she became absolutely our best leash walker because she didn't have an agenda. She wasn't a puller. She didn't have to go see everybody else. She wanted to be with us. So she would just trot along right beside us with her leash on. We never had to do a bit of training with her. And always looking up to make sure that we were there because we were her security blanket. So that's why she stayed right next to us. And I said, you know, eventually if this little dog wants to walk next to you, she's going to be the easiest leash walker you'll ever have. Because again, she doesn't have an agenda. She just wants to be with you. So she's only had this little dog for two weeks and lots of stuff for them to work on. And she said, well, she doesn't want to play with toys. Again, foreign object. Dog has no idea what a toy is. Nobody's ever played with a toy with her. I mean, people might have thrown things at her, but they've never thrown something for her. So she said, well, she picked up a ball once. And I said, well, that's a good start. I said, well, you know, let's find a high value treat that she likes. And let's start with the easiest game of hide and go seek you've ever imagined. I said, find what's a high value treat. Do this when she's a little hungry before she has her dinner. And just take those high value treats and make them pretty obvious for hide and go seek. They might be right out in the middle of the room, but let's teach her to kind of go looking, use her sniffer a little bit. And let's start with a really easy game. And then we can up the stakes on the game once she gets used to the game. And I said, reward her every time she finds one. And she said, well, if she just got the food treat, what's my reward? I said, she wants you. Pat her, give her praise, snuggle her, whatever it is that she really enjoys. I mean, if she enjoys that high, oh, you're such a good girl, and a little a little pat, that's all you need because they you're bonding the dog to you. So we're going to start with, you know, first finding a treat that she, well, we got to get her teeth cleaned and get the loose ones out of there so she's not painful. Finding a really, really high value treat which is probably going to be meat-based and um, then teaching her simple games and then working our way up to more complex games where she actually is going to have to search further than the middle of the room um, and getting her to explore a little bit. And then I said, you know, take a toy and put something high value on it, whether that's a little almond butter, a little liverwurst, I don't care, smear something that tastes yummy on it. And maybe that'll get her to want to go after the toy a little bit or lick the toy or play with the toy. We just have to take it really slow with these guys. And when you're walking them outside, remember they've spent their whole life in a building. Uh, now, we also have the strays. They're not puppy mills, but we get a lot of these stray dogs coming up from the south. And that while they might have been living outside, they probably weren't living under good conditions. They may have been shot at. They may have been chased. They may have been yelled at. Um, and they certainly weren't fed anything that was good for them while they were out scavenging in the garbage dumps. So there's a lot of things outside that are scary for these animals. Noises. Cars backfires, trucks, sirens, all kinds of scary things that are out there. So you want to take them out in a safe environment, make them feel very, very, very safe, get them used to these things really gradually. Because it's, it's you know, if, if you think about it, I once had to take an anthropology class to fulfill on electives in college. And if you think about putting yourself in a situation that you've never been in. So let's say you just pack up and move to Hong Kong. You don't know anything about the culture there. You don't speak the language. You don't understand how to, you know, get from point A to point B. You don't know how to, you know, ask anybody to find a hotel or to find a driver or, you know, how to, you know, find restaurants. Put yourself in a very strange environment that you've never been in before where everything is foreign to you. And that's what it's like for these guys. So in my anthropology class, we had to read an article called The Nasarima. I would recommend if you can find that article, it is totally worth the read. Next week, I'll tell you what The Nasarima is about if you don't find it. Um, Hugh's sitting there going, hmm, I'm going to go find that article. Very interesting, shocking article. And it really is a good explanation. And the fact that I can remember that article from when I was a freshman in college, that tells you something. Um, it's a, you know, it really kind of explains what these rescue animals go through with everything being so foreign. You know, even just living inside a house with microwaves beeping and toasters popping and, and TVs blaring, that's all foreign. They've never seen any of that stuff. So uh, you kind of have to put yourself in their place where the world can be a very scary place, especially when you're this big and everything around you is this big. It's kind of like, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk and, you know, he becomes in the giant's world and it's like, oh my gosh, everything is so huge. Okay, I got to get to work. Another busy day. Are we doing music? I don't know, maestro. We have our producer back. He's walking slow, but he's walking, so... <laughs> 
his biggest biggest problem is he's not allowed to do anything. He's not allowed to lift anything. So I've been carrying four out of the five dogs up and down the two flights of stairs multiple times a day. And yesterday I brought home the biggest order of pet food we've ever had. I think I carried 40 cases of cat food downstairs, six huge bags of kitty litter, a bunch of cases of freeze-dried food. <laughs> the frozen food came the day before and carried those cases. And Hugh has to stand there and watch me. It's killing him. 